our first presenter today for the session uh, use of equipment lighting during snowplow operations uh, is Laura Fay. Now, Laura is the associate director of the Center for Environmentally Sustainable Transportation in Cold Climates. Uh, Laura has a, a master's degree and is a research scientist and program manager for the Winter Maintenance and Effects Group at the Western Transportation Institute at Montana State University. Uh, she holds a, a master's, master's degree in environmental science and health from the University of Nevada and uh, a BS in uh, Earth Sciences from the University of California. She has a, uh, a decade of transportation related research experience and has demonstrated uh, and demonstrated publication record in the area of winter maintenance operations and environmental issues related to winter maintenance operations. Uh, Ms. Fay is an active member of uh, TRB under the National uh, Academies, serving on the Low Volume Roads Committee and the Winter Maintenance Workshop. And the Winter Maintenance Committee, excuse me. Chairing the 2011 TRB Environmental Management of Low Volume Roads Workshop and serving as a, on the Technical Committee for the uh, 2015 TRB Low Volume Roads Conference. Additionally, she is a founding member of the Unpaved Roads Institute and has served on the planning committee for the 2008, 2011, and 2014 Road Dust Management Conferences. Uh, please welcome uh, Laura Fay. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. Thank you for coming. I apologize. I clearly sent in a very long bio, and thank you for reading the whole thing, but Laura would have been enough. So, Okay, so like you shouldn't do, I added a few slides at the last minute, so hopefully this goes smoothly. Um, we were informed just maybe a week ago that one of the speakers can't make it, so we have maybe five extra minutes, so I thought I'll take all the time I can get. Um, and then with that being said, this is an invited speaker session. So these papers will not be in the compendium or TRR. So at the end of the presentation, I have a slide showing where you can get the final report and all the documentation related to this report. So if you wait till the end, great, or you can come back in at the end of the talk. So, so again, this title of the project is Use of Equipment Lighting During Snowplow Operations. And I'd really like to just focus on the identified best practices. Because this is an invited speaker session, I don't have a lot of authors of journal papers to thank, but I would like to thank everyone that worked on the project. Uh, Mr. Ambu Muthumani is my right-hand guy, and he did a lot of the work on this, as well as Dave Bergner with Monte Vista Associates, played a huge role in completing this project. This project was funded through Clear Roads and Minnesota DOT, and um, they have a technical advisory committee on all their projects, and they have a heavy hand in kind of helping to direct the research and making sure you hit all the important points. So I'd like to thank them, as well as the survey participants. You'll see why in a minute. And then um, when you conclude a Clear Roads project, they do webinars at the end. And in the webinar, I had a great conversation with a gentleman by the name of Mark from Arizona DOT. And he has taken some of the some of the suggested implementation require or suggested best practices to Arizona DOT already, collected data this year, and got it to me already so that I could include it in this presentation as a case example. So a huge thank you to him. I know his boss is in the audience, or I hope he is. So Mark's amazing. He did a great job. Thank you very much. So quickly, I'll go over the methodology. Um, it's a synthesis report, so it's basically just a literature review, a survey, and then you write the document. What I'd really like to focus on here is that we sent out the survey to all Clear Roads member states, which I think is 33 right now, 
And then we also blasted the snow and ice listserv just to try and get it out there. We heard back from 58 people, which is really good just for a normal survey response representing 26 states. We then asked individual people within each state to serve as a contact point because we wanted the surveys to actually go to the operators and get feedback directly from them. And from 11 states, we got close to 350, 400 responses, which is like amazing. It's off the charts. I've never had a survey response like that, which shows me that this is a, an important issue and that it really matters to the operators. And then, of course, we made the synthesis, which I'll present here. So this introduction to the topic in general, this is basically everything that's covered in the report. I'm not going to cover all this in detail in this 25-minute talk. So if you're interested in something that I don't really discuss much, please go to that report. So what we looked at were types of light bulbs and the color, the intensity of the light, the different mounting locations and how all these different aspects of it can affect that, flashing patterns versus in flashing intervals, amperage requirements, uh, mechanisms to prevent snow from blowing over the plow onto the windshield, and then mechanisms to keep the lights clear of snow. Retroreflective markings was also kind of thrown in there, and then day versus night settings for lights. So it's kind of a, it's a really broad report. So to jump into it, um, one of the first sections we cover are auxiliary headlights, and these are typically mounted on the front of the snowplow vehicle, and they provide supplemental illumination um, for the driving surface. Now, this is a combination of information that we captured from the survey as well as the literature review. Um, what I initially present aren't always the best practices, but this is what we found and at the end and the conclusions, I really summarize it down to, this is really what folks liked. And, and so I don't want to confuse you too much. But halogen bulbs are most commonly used in auxiliary headlights, followed by the LED bulbs. And LED bulbs are just obviously being incorporated either in retrofits or in newer vehicles, and as light bulbs just need to be changed. And that kind of seems like an obvious statement. But here's why. So on the, the picture on the right-hand side, the top and the bottom, that's the LED bulb and on the left is the halogen. And so you can really see the difference in lighting. And this is on a clear night, there is no snow falling. So you can imagine the light bounce back issues you may get, and we'll talk about that later. But basically LEDs produce light closer to daylight, they're energy efficient, and they have a long service life. But of course, nothing's perfect, and these LEDs don't produce a lot of heat, so they can ice up and get covered. So it's kind of an issue that I'll talk about more. So mounting location and beam width for the auxiliary lights. So light bounce back can be a severe issue with where these are mounted. Um, so the mounting location and the beam width play a key role in trying to reduce that bounce back. Common places for mounting are the truck body, the cab hood, the plow frame, and then some other folks provided some other options. But what we suggest is mounting the auxiliary headlights away from the operator's line of sight and using a narrow beam, almost like a spotlight beam. And this really helps to reduce that bounce back and scatter. So I call it like Star Wars driving when you're driving in the snow and it just looks like that and your headlights just, all they do is pick up all the snow and you can't see anything else. So that's really what we're trying to minimize here. And then the other best practice is to consider mounting the auxiliary headlights at the lowest possible location um, without promoting additional snow from getting on them to cover them up. So common colors for auxiliary headlight bulbs. Um, so recent studies have been conducted and did not find any significant advantages of using yellow or any other color um, to reduce bounce back um, and glare issues when it's snowing. Um, so what we're basically saying is the color of the headlights may have little impact on improving visibility, but changing your mounting location may have a greater impact overall than just changing the lighting color. So moving on to warning lights. Warning lights typically provide increased visibility in snow by indicating the position and direction of travel of the vehicles. So this is a safety measure, and they can be mounted anywhere, forward, rear, side mount, flush mount. And again, based on the survey and the literature review, we found that agencies are more commonly using LEDs now for many reasons. 
Um, LEDs are brighter, and the study in Minnesota found that LEDs perform well and in many cases better when viewed from most angles. But once one comment came in that when you're looking at an LED from kind of an off angle, it actually has reduced visibility. So you may either need to increase the amount of lights you have or the direction that they're facing. So the color of warning lights. <laughs> so there's a lot of information I present on here, two slides. And basically what I'm saying is, is that everybody's trying different colors and nobody has decided what they like best. So I'll just, I'll say that, but we can read through it. So amber seems to be the preferred color in Indiana. Um, a lot of the snowplow operators prefer white or amber. Um, and then a study also found that kind of the reds and yellows may actually have a negative impact on what you're viewing. North Dakota believes that white's the best. Um, and then I'll show you in the next slide a photo. Some folks are testing steady burn green lights, um, flashing blue and white lights. So let's see this next photo. So here's an example of some of the green lights. And in the photo, they really pop. I don't know if that's what they actually look like in the field, but this is just an example of the amber and the green together. So the intensity of the warning lights. Um, agencies are choosing the brightest bulb they possibly can, which usually happens to be an LED. Um, and survey respondents indicated that for um, these lights, uh, that they can never be too bright. But people are always concerned for drivers that maybe you're going to blind them at night. And I've had that happen, and I'm sure you guys have. But brighter lights appear to warn drivers better of an approaching snowplow. Um, but they also suggest that maybe there is a switch where you could have a lower intensity setting. So under certain conditions when there's a really big contrast, if it's really dark out for some reason, like there's a cloud ceiling or something, that you could maybe dim the lights a little on those really dark nights. And of course, for safety reasons, that vehicles need to just give the plow some space, which I think is obvious and most of us know that. So flashing pattern and interval. So the ability of the driver to detect the presence of the snowplow vehicle is different from the ability of the driver to detect the relative speed of the snowplow. Mm -hmm. And that's kind of important with lighting because different lighting types help with each different aspect. So the flashing lights increase the overall visibility of the snowplow, whereas the steady burn lights allow drivers to determine how fast the snowplow is either driving towards them or away from them. And so it's Ideally, you would have both on a vehicle, but if you're going to only have one, studies have shown that maybe consider having just a steady burn light. And then the other finding that we found was that if you have flashing lights as well as other lights, they should not be excessively brighter than the other lights because it will totally distract from the other lights. So the mounting location. Um, Agencies are trying to mount the forward warning lights to achieve complete visibility. So 360 visibility, they'd be mounted high, but that's not always possible. Um, rear war warning lights are commonly flush mounted or mounted on bars up above, and I'll show a picture of that. Um, and if you have uh, multiple colors, they should be mounted a reasonable distance from each other so the light itself doesn't blend together. You can see them as distinguished, unique colors. So here's an example of the Telespar lights. This is North Dakota DOT vehicle. And um, you can see here that you're, it's, it's a bonus. Not only are the lights high and you can view them from far away, but because they're mounted away from the vehicle, the wind is actually preventing snow from sticking to them. So, but of course, you're going to knock them off if you're not careful when you're loading the vehicle. So you just have to be more careful going in and out of the shed, loading it up, stuff like that. So here's a little diagram we put together just as a suggestion. We're not telling you have to do this. But we suggest that um, for longer viewing distance, you want to capture both of those lights, the steady burn and um, the flashing. And you can see that the flashing lights on the top are mounted high enough so that you can see them from multiple sides. And then as the, the vehicle on the bottom gets closer, you're viewing that steady burn so you can see how close you are to the vehicle and you have better depth perception to determine where you're going. So working lights, um, working lights are floodlights or spotlights and they can be mounted at various <coughs> locations on the truck exterior 
and they're strictly for illumination. So do you want to see what the wing plow is doing? Do you have a tow plow and do you need that lit up? Um, typical mounting locations of the working lights are identified by the survey respondents were at the side and the rear of the vehicles and LEDs and halogens are, are most common for working lights. White is the preferred color and I think it was like 95% of people use white light. Um, so mechanisms to prevent snow blowing over the plow. Um, this is covered in way more detail in the report, so if you're interested, please check that out. But basically what we found was that over plow deflectors with a trap angle less than 50 degrees seem to work really well. And that um, though it works well and it's been studied, not a lot of people have these. They love them, but they don't have them. And some other tricks that folks from the survey told us is that if they have airfoils or bug shields, those serve a similar purpose um, in the winter. So that's good. And so I mentioned previously that LEDs are great, they're bright, they're energy efficient, they last a long time, but they can ice up. And what you can see here on the left is um, a standard strobe, and on the right is an LED in heavy snow conditions. So one of the comments we got back from Arizona, which I'll go over later, is basically the drivers were having to stop, bang the snow and ice off the lights so they could see and then get back in the vehicle. And not only is that a pain, but it also presents a safety issue on multiple fronts. So there's a couple options for dealing with that. Um, wind deflectors can be used. Um, and here you can see um, a vehicle, Mount Rose Highway. So this is Nevada DOT. And on the left, um, you have a vehicle without an airfoil. And on the right, you have a vehicle with an airfoil. And not only is your vehicle not crusted in snow and rime, but it also provides visibility of a lot of the lights. So while we recommend that a lot of the lights should be mounted low, not too low, because that airfoil is not going to cover the entire back of the vehicle. These are just a few other options for preventing snow. So another option that exists out there but has not been used too heavily is a thin sheet <coughs> heater that goes over kind of the outside cap of the LED. And um, you have to obviously have it wired in. Um, it'd be interesting to see maybe someone do some testing on these and how well they work, especially out in the field in tough conditions. I live in Montana. It can get very cold. How well did they hold up? I don't know. Um, there have been some issues with heated lenses when you're in really cold environments that you get an ice cap around them. So it's not serving enough of a purpose to melt the snow off the lighting surface. And again, you can always just maybe mount the lights a little higher and away from the vehicle and utilize the wind as you're driving to help clear the snow and ice off that light. So another kind of smaller component of this project looked at retro reflective markings. Um, and the, the long and short of it is people love them. They use them in all different colors and um, they really like them. But the problem is that they get dirty and they get covered in snow and they're ineffective when they're covered. So in the vendor area, there was a guy talking about reflective markings and I said, the companies need to figure out a way so that they don't retain stuff on the surface. I know that's probably an impo impossible task, but if the guys don't have to go in and spray off their vehicles every couple hours, if they could just utilize that reflective technology, that would, again, be another safety um, impact. So day versus night settings. Um, the combination of more light sources and higher intensity may actually temporarily blind approaching drivers. This happened to me the other night as I was leaving the ski hill, and I was like, ah, oh, you need a day versus night setting. Um, so what we recommend is that using different intensity lighting for the day and the night for the operators. And some of the newer vehicles have the option where this is done automatically for you. There's a sensor and it just switches the lights. And then um, a few years ago, they offered a switch so you could manually <coughs> modify the intensity of the lights. But what we found is that it's just not really common in the vehicles. And the drivers would love it. They just don't have the option to use it. So, if you want to consider maybe one inexpensive technology to implement, you could try that. So again, I want to thank Mark at Arizona DOT. Basically in the last month, he got me a lot of data 
created a survey all by himself, got it out to the operator. So I'm just going to quickly present the case example. Um, so the findings obviously were that LEDs are more common now, but there are some issues with icing and the, the manual um, switch for the day versus night settings. And he basically implemented those two practices. And here are his comments and his operator's comments. So um, a couple years ago, they put in an LED prototype auxiliary lighting package. And it cost about $3,000. I've got the cost information for you guys if you want to look at what that equates to. Um, and so the first year, it just wasn't a good winter, so we didn't get a lot of data. So he was really hoping that this winter would be better, and it has been. Um, initially, the operators liked the visibility, but they were having light bounce back issues. So here's what the vehicle looks like with the lights. And here's the cost data. So it's really not that expensive. So what Mark did is he created the survey, he sent it out to the operators, only of the drivers using the trucks with these options, and here's what they said. Um, with regard to light bounce back and scatter, they thought the new LED package was better, a six out of 10, which isn't great, but better. Um, but the drivers independently commented that they felt like a lower mounting location would be better. So it just further kind of validates the other information we found. Um, and that driver visibility was also rated as better with the LED package with the 7.5 and the effects of the plow lighting for oncoming traffic. Now this is totally anecdotal, but they were like, it was fine. So we don't know. They basically didn't ask the oncoming drivers if the lights were too bright or not. Overall, they rated the new LED package as eight out of 10. Their only comment was that um, they recommended the change by including a heating lens on the LEDs. And you can see here, um, for rating each individual lighting type, the LED got a 4.5 out of 10, only because of the icing issues. One of the guys said, we loved it, and he wanted to give it an eight out of 10, but he couldn't, because he had to keep getting out of his truck to bang the ice off of it. So here's another vehicle with the mounting location shown. Um, and then in this vehicle, they added an on-off switch or a manual control switch for day versus night settings. And um, they had good snow this year and they had some heavy fog conditions, so they were able to really kind of play with the lighting system in these new situations. Um, the driver said he loves the switch. He uses it all the time, um, switching between um, bright lights and less bright lights, except when he's um, doing cleaning operations when he wants lights on all the time, and then he just leaves it on. So based on the success, Mark seems gung-ho about this, and he wants to move forward with doing more, but they do need to figure out something with the LEDs and the icing issues. So just quickly in conclusion, LEDs are most commonly used. Um, auxiliary lights, um, consider mounting them away from the snow operator's line of sight with a narrow beam at the lowest possible location. Um, and one of the issues with LEDs is that they seem to ice up and they don't melt the snow off the surface. But overplow deflectors have been found to be very effective at keeping snow off or airfoils, um, to keeping the equipment itself free of rime, but also the lighting package. Amber is most commonly used. Um, for most lights, white's preferred for working lights, but again, kind of, at this point, it's just a preference. There's no real study that shows one light is the best. For flashing lights and steady burn lights, um, they should be spaced apart um, or not too closely. And with retroreflective markings, the colors didn't really seem to be a big issue or the pattern of them. Really, the issue was that they were getting covered with dirt and snow. And that wind deflectors and heated lenses should be considered in intense winter environments. And that because of the increased light that you get from the LEDs, you should maybe consider having on-off or day versus night settings, which at this point are available but are not commonly implemented. <coughs> So with that being said, I would love to take some questions. The report um, is on the Clear Roads website, and it's the final report. There's also a webinar, so if you want your staff to view the webinar, it's all there on the web. Um, and there's also a, a brief 
like a two-pager for the project. So that's all I have. Thank you very much.